Good evening, everyone. My name is Stephanie Sobeck Swant, and I'm the executive director of RARE. Thank you for joining us tonight for RARE's third conversation for conservation of this year. And we are so pleased that you can join us along with our guest speaker tonight, Demisha Dennis, who is here from Brown Girl Outdoor World to discuss what the invitation to an inclusion, inclusion in the environmental movement can look like for communities of color from an organizational standpoint, and to also dive into the work of grassroots group like Brown Girl Outdoor World, creating space to remind folks that communities historically excluded from the mainstream movement have long-standing relationships with the care and protection of nature and the environment. But before I introduce Demisha to you, I would like to first acknowledge the territory we are on. I'm speaking here tonight uh, from the city of Kitchener, which is on the Haldeman Tract. And the Rare Charitable Research Reserve acknowledges and is grateful to all of the original stewards of the land in which Rare resides within the Haldeman Tract, spanning six miles on either side of the Grand River from source to mouth. Understanding that this land has been rich in diverse indigenous presence since time immemorial, we would like to honor and respect the sovereignty of both First Nations in our area. The Haudenosaunee people of the Six Nations of the Grand River and the Anishinaabe people of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Niagwe and Miigwech to these nations who share their lands with us. We'd also like to acknowledge the neutral peoples and their ancestors and the indigenous Paleo hunters who resided on these lands as long as 10,500 years ago. I would also like to acknowledge those indigenous peoples who currently live, work, and learn in the urban landscape around us, such as other self-identified and status First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. As an organization that is committed to reconciliation with all indigenous peoples of Turtle Island, we recognize that our land acknowledgement is only a very first, very small step in the process of healing and building better relationships with one another and with the land and waters. We will continue to honor our commitment to reconciliation by continuing to learn more about truths and our settler responsibilities, working towards creation of meaningful and systemic change in relationship building that accommodates indigenous collaborators at rare to braid indigenous knowledges and worldviews. And with this, I'm very pleased to welcome Demisha Dennis here tonight. Demisha Dennis is the founder and CEO of Brown Girl Outdoor World. As an outdoor enthusiast with a passion for building community and representation in outdoor spaces, she shares her love for the outdoors through various adventures while encouraging and inspiring others to step out and do the same. She's actively working to change present narratives regarding people of color and their place and engagement in outdoor spaces. When not navigating Toronto's corporate jungle, she can be found fishing, bungee jumping, camping, or hiking from coast to coast and doesn't see herself stopping anytime soon. With the community behind her working to make tangible changes, she's guiding others into nature and challenging them to change the narrative for outdoor adventure. Demisha, I hope we hear a lot about your important work tonight and feel free to add on to your bio because there was uh, there's a lot of background there that I think is really interesting and exciting. So we look very much forward to hear from you tonight. And after Demisha's talk, we will have time for some questions. And if you in the audience have something you'd like to ask, I, uh, I ask you to please use the question and answer the Q&A box rather than the chat box so that we can make sure we see your questions and can share them with Demisha as well. And now please join me and welcome Demisha Dennis. Hi, Stephanie, thank you for having me. And thank you to the Rare team for the invitation to present about outdoor, Brown Girl Outdoor World and some of the work we do in the, uh, in the outdoor space and generally across, um, across our platform. So before we start, I, Stephanie did a land acknowledgement, but I'd also like to do one from the perspective of Brown Girl Outdoor World and state that Brown Girl Outdoor World acknowledges that the lands on which we play, grow and learn are on the territory, territories of many nations. We operate from the city of Toronto and acknowledge this as a traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, including Inuit, including, sorry, diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. Um, so again, thank you for having me here tonight. And this won't be a really technical talk. It'll be more from a, first person and, and lived experience uh, perspective. Um, so Brown Car Outdoor World, who are we? 
Brown Girl Outdoor World is a social purpose organization working to change present narratives around Black, Indigenous, and globally diverse communities of color as it relates to our place in the outdoors. Uh, through diverse education advocacy access, through, sorry, through advocacy, through adventure, education, advocacy, access, and opportunities. Um, I have a, uh, a slide that I've put together that, that I'm going to share, and that will be the guide to go through the presentation tonight. Just going to share my screen. Okay, so the presentation tonight is titled Setting, Setting the Table, Invitation and Inclusion in the Conservation Movement. And before we start, I wanted to say that this again is by no means speaking for an entire community, but more so speaking to a general understanding of um, of communities of color and their, and their place in the outdoors. So this evening, you'll hear a few words that come up in, in conversation and feel free to take notes about this or to, um, I'll probably share the slide when I'm done. And again, this is being recorded. So we speak, diversity speaks to the collective mixture of differences and similarities that includes, for example, individual and organizational characteristics, values, beliefs, experiences, backgrounds, preferences, and behaviors. And this is according to the Society of Human Rights Resources Movement Management. The word indigenous, distinct social and cultural groups that share collective ancestral, ancestral ties to the land and natural resources where they live, occupy, or from which they have been displaced. Inclusion. Inclusion speaks to the act of welcoming and including a range of people and having their input and perspectives valued and considered for action, considered for action within the context of a collaborative endeavor. Historically excluded, includes any group of people that have been over time, over the course of time, been excluded from full rights, privileges, and opportunities in a society or organization. Okay. It is important that in this conversation, we understand that while we use the term BIPOC, which again speaks to black indigenous people of color, and I've used this interchangeably because I don't like the term BIPOC. So I have been using for myself, black indigenous and globally diverse communities of color, because that speaks more to who BGOW, um, Brown Girl Outdoor World serves and how we view folks that come into, um, into the community. We don't create opportunities. We don't create uh, um, programming that speaks to everyone as a collective, but we try to pull in the different uh, perspectives and different ideas and different ways of living for everyone uh, that comes into our community. Sorry, I've just skipped ahead in my, uh, in my presentation here. Okay. So conservation from a first-hand perspective, and I'll speak about this in the sense where I grew up in Jamaica as a, you know, pretty, um, pretty observant teen and a pretty, a teen that was pretty much connected to the outdoors because growing up in Jamaica, there is no concept of you actually being inside. You're out, your play space, your, your, your place for growth, your place for knowledge is outside. And that is for me, it was with my grandma when she was tilling the soil to plant her vegetables, or she was um, gathering rain water to 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 um, water those vegetables, or to um, the way she would use certain things around the house. And to me, that spoke to to now that I can put it in a context in a North American context, because I didn't grow up seeing conservation as conservation. It was just how we moved about the land. It was how we moved about our ways of living, and it was so tied to doing things in a way that didn't disrupt um didn't disrupt nature even though i grew up in a mining community it still spoke to us in different ways of we weren't a part of that community we did what we needed to do to protect the land that we were living on and to protect the land around the places that were being mined it even came down to the point of my my um my grandma advocating against said mining company within the neighborhood to have them do land reclamation and to make sure that was land that was viable for use in the community so it didn't start for me here. It just didn't have a name or a story until I moved to Canada, until that became a part of 
the work and how I saw myself fitting into the, to, into the narrative of what Canada is. Um, this presentation that I'm giving tonight, it will not speak to any one specific group. Again, because we cannot, no one person can speak for an entire population or entire community of people, but we can share perspectives and similar or perspectives that come from discussions and conversations, but cannot speak for any one group. Um, we'll speak to a broad range of initiatives and create a welcome and how, so what we'll do is we'll um, speak about ways in which, some ways in which organizations can engage strategies to speak to a broad range of initiatives and create a welcoming space for black, indigenous and globally diverse communities of color. Um, so we spoke about like the initial conversation we said we, it was creating the invitation. When we're having a dinner or a dinner party, we never just invite folks. We get to understand, we get to know the people who we're inviting, even from a, a business perspective, that there must be some kind of relationship that was created before we sent out that invitation. And it's not very different when you're speaking about inviting communities of color into the conservation movement. So what I think about is to create an invitation, I'm gonna identify the problem before I start saying, hey, let me send out invitation for everyone to come into my home or to come into my community or to come into a space that is, is, is considered, um, considered precious to me. And that is how I look at conservation. Conservation is, it is a big thing that so many of us participate in, but there are bits and pieces of it that communities hold sacred. So what are we doing? We're gonna identify the problem. And for me, who you notice in the, is a prominent face in the conservation movement will help identify who along with their stories is actually missing. Um, for as long as we can remember, and we, what, who we see as engaging conservation initiatives has been spoken to as an older white male narrative being the voice of the movement. Um, especially here in North America, that is the con con conversation that we often have, we often see presented in magazines, in any printed documents, any, um, any organizations, that is generally the, 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 the image that we see. More recent efforts to diversify who is seen as active in conservation has stopped as simply trying to increase female representation. But we need to go just a bit further. Many communities, I think, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's important again that we understand that many communities have been deeply engaged in conservation before it became a mainstream movement. Including the stories of these communities, the practices and ways of knowing can help to formulate how we practice conservation in a North American context and help folks from the communities who have been excluded for so long to now feel included. I don't know what's, what's pressing all over the, uh, something's deciding that it wants to jump ahead in my presentation. Do, do, do. Okay, so we've identified who's missing. It is identified to acknowledge, to, it is important to identify, acknowledge and address the ways in which black, indigenous and globally diverse communities have, of color have long been absent from the mainstream conservation movement and how through exclusionary practices, many conservation orgs have contributed to this. To foster new and dynamic relationships with these excluded communities, it is key that we not only acknowledge the exclusion, but that we create an invitation so that folks from the communities can see themselves as critical to the conservation movement here in Canada. And when I say consider themselves critical, um, I look at it, you know, Canada is such a diverse place. And if we stick to the narrative of it only being one group of people who are concerned with our environment or one group of people who are concerned about the conservation movement itself, then we're leaving out a whole group of people. If we look at conservation from the perspectives of community who have migrated to Canada, we simply acknowledge that their conservation practices didn't just disappear. It is up to organizations who are engaged in this work to find ways to build trust and create a welcoming environment for these individuals, their stories, traditional ways of conservation, and make them relevant to the work being done here on Canadian soil. Considering some key pieces of information regarding Canada's population growth and how that speaks to the larger conversation around inclusion of diverse communities in the conservation movement is one way in which we can think about how like steps and strategies that we need to create to ensure the communities 
that are coming in are included. According to Statistics Canada, by 2036, 30% of Canada's population could be made up of between 34.7 and 39.9 people of, globally, of a globally diverse group. If we aren't actively seeking to include the stories and practices of the new communities, what are we then saying to what could be a large piece of Canada's population? Are we saying you, your stories, and your ways of knowing don't belong? And I speak about this in the sense of when I, I, get, I get contacted often because of the business I run with Brown Girl Outdoor World and um, how we get involved with community organizations to do some of this conservation work and what that looks like. And it always doesn't come from a place of looking like exactly what everyone thought a group of conservationists would look like. We go outside, we get the questions, we get the, uh, we get the looks, we get the conversations around, one, how did you get here? You know, what do you think? What we, we're expected often to speak about, speak for everyone. But if we are including people from, from different communities who are coming to Canada, making Canada their home, then these conversations now become more broad, there are more perspectives, there are, um, no one is being expected to carry the conversation for everyone, but people's knowledge comes into play. To effectively connect with communities who have made Canada their home and make up a large percentage of the communities of color population, groups interested in getting these communities involved in conversation that speaks to their new home must employ ways that speak to how they connected to the land in their ancestral homes. So for me, again, growing up in Jamaica and, and that being what I consider home and what I consider the, the, the foundation of my, my life as an adult, um, most of my learning was done there. I did, we did a lot of planting of crops. We did a lot of, um, of um, when it came to, to working with the land, mostly everything was, we did was pretty manual. And we saw wasted in the least way disrupt the natural cycle of, 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 the, of the land and how we, we related to it. Um, I remember, you know, just sim simple things like my grandma out planting her, her root vegetables and how careful she was not to dis disturb the ecosystem, not to disturb, you know, putting stuff like no chemicals, no nothing, because she was so concerned about what the end product would be for everyone else who's going to use that land or the end product for the generations to come after. And this was someone who, my grandma died at 100, 101. So she's been here for a while. And she, she the, the knowledge that she had and passed down and passed on to, you know, cousins, her, most of her 13 kids are things that we try to implement now that we're here. Um, families that have moved on to the US or other parts of the world, they too implement a lot of things and a lot of those things and how they, they, they interact with the environment. One other key point that I think we, we, often, um, we often miss is when we speak of indigenous practices and conservation, we often speak only of the practices of North American indigenous communities, but fail to identify how the immigration of indigenous peoples from other contents can play into how we see and welcome others into this conversation. We must consider similar, what similarities exist and how these, including these practices could benefit the larger conservation movement and the discussions around inclusion. One of the things I like to think about is, you know, when we're working with organizations, are those organizations thinking years ahead or are they looking at the immediate and saying, we need to get folks in here now to do this now? Where the now doesn't really work. We need to start thinking very long-term about what the relationship will end up looking like years after we've come into we've come into um, come into into being in this space. Years after, you know, these the folks that you've now invited into this conversation, are we providing them with information that their grandkids could, you know, they could pass on to their grandkids or to their children or to their, you know, other members in their community? So we need to think about the desired outcome of that relationship not just on a subsurface level, but enough that it's going to make someone think about how they themselves through this relationship are gonna be involved with conservation. Don't just say get involved, but think about what supports are being offered to foster an environment where, where, where participation feels important. And what I mean by that is we cannot like, we use a slogan, Nike says, just do it. And I don't think the conservation movement is a just do it thing. I think we need to build relationships that are sustainable over time 
and that are beneficial to both the conservation organization and to the people that they're getting involved with. And that's going to take a lot of relationship building. It's going to take a lot of work on either part to make sure that these are, are, are working and that these are conversations that are, are welcoming for each, for each um, side of the, con the conversation. I have a thing to try to mix up conservation and, con and conversation. It happens often. Don't judge me too harshly. So the next big thing is inclusion and changing the narrative. When it comes to expanding the conversation around who is associated with conversation, conservation, there you go, the steps taken can either make, break, or strengthen any existing or new relationships with Black, Indigenous, and globally diverse communities of color. This is where consultation, collaboration, and genuine conversations with the group you're seeking to engage becomes imperative. Remember, no one individual can speak to the experiences or need of each group and the strategies employed must take in, dynamic, take in the dynamic makeup of these communities. So again, even though I'm presenting here tonight and I'm speaking about what inclusion could look like or what an invitation for communities of color could look like in the conservation space, this is a very much a Demisha Spurt perspective based on conversations that she's had with members of the BGOW community or members outside of the BGOW community who she has built relationships with who are comfortable in discussing these topics or who are seeking to learn more about how they too can get involved in conservation. So this is definitely not me trying to say, hey, I have a handle on what everyone from the Black community needs, or I have a handle on, you know, what is going to be the perfect solution for people from the Black community. I can't do that. I can give you strategies and I can tell you ways, but for me to speak with, on, on behalf of everyone, it would be totally counterproductive because then you're getting my views and my biases involved in that. And I'm now telling you exactly only what I want. That's not going to be beneficial to another group. So we think about, when we think about, you know, how are we going to engage communities of color? How are we going to get that conversation started in the first place? I'm in this work for a very long time and I don't see much engagement. I don't see much involvement from these communities. One of the important pieces is to ask ourselves why. Why don't we see this representation here in, in, in the work? Why don't we see the communities that we really want to be here? And to think about whether or not we really want to engage these communities. Are we going to be doing, you know, are we willing to step outside of what's comfortable to us and to get a, get a, lot, a lot uncomfortable to have the conversation around what we need to change, how we're going to go about changing it and where we need to be in the, in, in the bigger picture of getting folks into, into that movement. So some ways I, I think to, to begin supporting change and including diverse perspectives in water initiatives around inclusion in the movement can look like. One of the main things for me is understanding language. Um, one moment, there I go again, I have to go back to the, uh, back to my slide. Understanding language. The language we use when speaking about conservation is extremely important, especially when speaking to communities of color. Does the language make the community feel seen, safe, and welcomed? Is the focus more on driving ideals of conservation instead of creating an atmosphere to allow these communities to become involved? And when I speak about safety, I'm not only speaking about the cycle of seeing, sorry, when I speak about the feeling seen and welcomed and, and safety, I'm not only speaking from a physical sense, I'm speaking from, the, from a psychological aspect where am I coming into a space that considers me worthy of being here? Am I coming into a space that I'm going to feel like my, my presence here is meaningful or that I'm, what I'm doing is impactful to, to, um, to these conversations or to the work that needs to be done? Um, is the, fo the focus more on driving ideals of conservation instead of creating an atmosphere to allow these communities to become involved? So we all have um, our own preconceived notions of what we think a movement is or what we think, who we think is involved in the movement or who we see as, you know, belonging in that movement. And again, if I'm being 100% honest, if I was supposed to rely on the imagery that I've seen from, from, um, from conservation here, I would venture out to say that I, as a Black woman, don't belong. 
why do I say that? Because everything I've seen printed, everything I've seen, you know, um, shared elsewhere, it doesn't speak to my narrative or my story belonging in this space. It doesn't speak to me being anything that of my experiences being valuable. So what we need to do is to go back to the drawing board and say, hey, if we're not seeing these communities, maybe we need to reassess why they're not here versus saying, we don't see them, we're just gonna leave it alone, or we don't see them, they're not, they're not, um, they're not interested. Oftentimes it requires going beyond what we see as what we see happening to create a room to make that 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 um, that space seem welcoming and to make that conversation seem like something that I really want to be interested in. When I moved to Canada, um, I didn't see that. And so that was a part of how of the research and the work that I did to figure out what conservation groups are around me? What communities am I getting involved in? How do I get involved in those communities? Am I going to feel like an outsider when I step into that space? And quite often up until I created a uh, space in Brown Girl Outdoor World for those conversations, it was often a place that felt very excluded, very exclusive. And I still didn't feel like my, my, my voice, my opinion or the work, the work that I could do mattered. Um, it was also around the language, the technical language that was being used around conservation. I think oftentimes we think about only approaching it from a scientific standpoint, and that often removes people who don't have that same level of scientific knowledge or that same level of education to say, hey, maybe I can do something here that doesn't require me to be like a specialist in this field or someone to be like fully knowledgeable in this. I think it requires us to step back and say, hey, what role can each individual play in this in 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 this um this conversation and how can we continuously keep on evolving our language to make sure that folks who are coming in are feeling included um another thing we can do is education and support so many communities lack access to resources that would for a, would allow for knowledge transfer in homes and through larger community circles that could offer more ease to getting involved how are you planning on providing education and resources to bridge that information gap? I look back, look and I think back to um, a few years ago when outdoor education was removed from a lot of schools. Um, and that kind of, when initially when I saw the announcement about that, I was like, how could you remove outdoor education? Who now is responsible for spreading that information around um, the importance of things like conservation, the, the, the the importance of thing around um, ecosystem management and all of that in schools. Because again, in certain communities, you might have those programs because those schools are able to afford to bring in individuals to, to spread that information. But if it's not something that's being supported on a large scale, a lot of communities and a lot of groups are missing out. And if we're not, again, involving the change, the, the, um, the decision makers in the home, which is what Bronco Outdoor World does, and I think I missed that part of it, we're not a youth focused organization we focus on educating the educators. So the decision makers in the home, those who have that spending power, those who you know, are the ones who really are going to, to, to engage those kids into going out and becoming involved in conservation movements. Um, when schools and after school programs and, and everything else has shut down as we've seen in COVID, the responsibility does come right back to home to make that available for kids. Um, Trust and community empowerment. Creating relationships that stem from a place of trust will be critical in having communities feel safe, seen, and welcomed in your organization. The conversation around including these communities will require you to show up and work to build relationships from a place of trust that does not currently exist. And why I say trust is such a big thing in this, in this, um, in this piece of it is because simply we've been communities have been excluded for so long. So when we see organizations coming in or, or, or um, coming in and saying, hey, we want to get you involved, all the questions start coming up. Everyone wants to know why all of a sudden my, my voice is important or why this take on this is important when for so long no one seemed to care. So it's going to require, you know, an individual who's interested in conservation or an organization who's interested in, in conservation to go in and step in and say, hey, we do see value in it. We've noticed the absence and we want to fix it and grow forward and grow forward together. So it's going to require you sometimes being in that very uncomfortable place of realizing that you're building a relationship from scratch. You're, um, you're talking to people who probably have never 
needed to, to have these conversations outside of their community groups and are now required to engage organizations to carry forth a lot of the work that, need, that needs to be done. Um, court communities are gonna, again, question your intentions. There will be reservation from many communities based on how the conversation is approached, given the history of exclusion in the movement. Be ready to answer tough questions around intent, what the impact of the relationship to the community will be over time, and to think how these answers will be presented. Again, that conversation around trust is going to be a very important piece of it that's going to allow communities to feel that you are somehow attached you know, to, their, to the work that is being, being done, that there is more for them there, that we're not simply just saying, hey, come do the work, join the party after, after you know, everything's already done and the damage has already been done, but now we need you to come in and help clean up, but we don't need you to be fully involved we're just going to make you here at a subsurface level. So, you know, we, we're not really taking into consideration anything that you've said, but we know your presence is here. We can see you, we see that you're physically here, but that isn't the purpose of the, the invitation to, to get communities involved. It's so that when you create that invitation and you create that space, folks will start spreading that information. They'll want to become involved. They'll want to step in. They'll want to be a part of that change that they can see happening. And then they will continue again, spreading that information throughout their communities, throughout their places of influence that you as an organization might not have because you haven't built that trust with community as yet, right? And so you're going to want to, you know, align yourself with these individuals who can share that story for you, who can spread the word about the work that you're doing and figure out how to get others in their communities involved. Can you ensure the community that the drive to include them is based in a need for genuine change and isn't simply performative? I don't know how much we've heard about, um, you know, performative relationships or how we've heard about communities who, again, don't operate on trust simply because the movement has not been there before, right? So it's like, you know, you coming up to, to me telling me that, hey, I really needed to, to, um, to join in on this, on this, this project. Well, what is the project? Why am I needed on the, on the project? You've never asked me to do anything of this before. Like you and I have never even had a conversation. So why am I going to be involved? It's going to require you going in as an organization and not telling these folks how, to how, how you want them to become in involved in conservation, but asking them how they would like to be involved and taking those responsibility, this was those responses and building something around, around that to make sure they do um, come in. Empowering community groups already involved in conservation through sharing of resources, collaborative partnerships with grassroots organizations already on the ground doing the work, and sharing of financial resources often unavailable to these smaller groups who can't gain um, a charitable status is super important. We often look at the at the the at this big picture, and we often think, you know, no, these communities aren't doing this work but they are doing the work. They are involved in the conservation process. They are involved in the movement, but just not to the level where you as an organization are used to looking. So many grassroots organizations are operating in, in conservation spaces. Many grassroots organizations, again, are being formed to operate in these spaces, but how are we creating an atmosphere to say we're here to support, we're here to engage with you, we're here to form a partnership. This partnership is going to be beneficial, not just to us as an organization, but to you, the grassroots community, through having our support, through having access to our resources, through having access to our knowledge and helping to spread and build that relationship that is going to be key in getting them involved. One of the things is that we can do also do, that organizations can also do rather, is hiring from the communities that are engaged. So we often go to conservation and, you know, again, we see that, 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 that narrative that's always been there, but it's not changing. Are we see it changing in terms of, you know, in terms of in terms of print? Are we seeing it changing in terms of who's running the organization from who's, you know, in the in the decision making role in the organization? And if everything you say is that you don't belong here at the top, you're only enough to work on the ground and to stay there, then that's not going to create an environment where folks really want to step in. So I think it's important that we are, you know, showing folks when we speak, letting folks know when we show up that we're here to build collaborative relationships because we really want to see change and are heavily invested in what this change will look like. So I know we spoke of the, 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 the um, organizational way of approaching the change in, con in conversation. 
But I think it's also important that we understand that organizations don't run without people. So at some point we do have to make this change about pers uh, like a personal perspective. Who are the people we have working for us and what is their, their knowledge around these communities of color who are excluded? What is the knowledge around communities of color who want to be in the conservation movement, but don't know where to start? Do they value the communities of color who are who we think as an organization we should be reaching out to? And I think that's really important because if we're if we're removing ourselves from as people from the story, then we're expecting a structure or a business to carry out the work that is very human based. So we need to step back and see, you know, we're going to, you know, we're going to step back and say, how are we going to reimagine the relationship that we thought communities of color had with with um, had to conservation? We're going to align ourselves um, or your org with movers in the space who are already doing the work and create meaningful long-term relationships that can lead to building trust across various diverse community groups. And when I say that, I'm you don't have to you don't have to find the biggest um, BIPOC organization or the biggest um, community of color organization that's doing the work, all you need to find are willing people who are ready to work with you based on terms that are agreed upon and are going to bring that work to their community. So you don't have to do the actual work of bringing the information. Sometimes all it needs is for you to make the connection there and to make your resources available to those groups and to those communities who are saying, hey, we really want to get this work done. We're really interested in getting involved. And here's how you know you as an organization can help. And you can take that information and run with it however you choose. But knowing that you're maintain, you've now started to build a relationship and you're ready to work to maintaining that relationship through creating um, stronger ties to the community, making it known that you're here to support is going to be super important. So we've aligned ourselves with the organizations and now the work comes to restore the faith in the work of conservation groups being about the preservation of our resources with everyone playing a part. We all see these um, often online, I, I see the, the, the phrase nature for all, but the narrative itself doesn't say that or the, the engagement in, in, in nature-based activities and the nature and the engagement in, in conservation movement doesn't say that. It often still says, this is not a space for you. We've already established this. We're making this work from our perspective. Now you need to figure that out for yourself. So we are no longer at the at the point where we're, we're we're all thinking that conservation is for the protection of and preservation of resources. We're now thinking that hey, maybe there are other motives here regarding regarding the conservation work, and we need to fix that. We need to you know create that change where everyone sees himself as a part of that movement because at the end of the day, conservation goes to benefit you know us in its in our entirety. Um. So a little bit about, you know, Brown Girl Outdoor World itself. And you'll see this phrase pop up if you're engaged in the work with us at all or you engage in conversation of us with us, you'll hear the term know it, love it, protect it. And by that, what we mean to say is if you're if you don't know, don't know nature, don't know conservation work around nature, you're not you you won't know it. You don't know it, you won't want to, you won't love it, and then you won't try to work to protect it. And the aim is every time we get out there and we do some work is to get people involved in knowing, loving, and protecting it. We can't just operate from a subsurface level all the time and say, hey, we go out, we get engaged, we have the fun, but it's over. We want people to start thinking more about how they can get involved, more about how they can come to know, love, and protect it. Um, where to find us as an organization? We are on our website is browngirloutdoorworld.com. We are on Instagram at Brown Girl Outdoor World with a pretty active community of active and engaged community and also on Twitter at Outdoor Brown. And I think I had said that our conversation would last about 45 minutes. Um, I think I'm just a little bit shy of that, Stephanie. So again, I'm here to answer any questions and here to for any discussions anyone might have. Yes, thank you so much, Dimisha. That, that was really, uh, really rich and, and really interesting. I, I took a lot of notes because there were a lot of things that you said that I feel really, really resonated with me and a lot of things that you, you called out that, that I, uh, I, I, I too notice. And, and of course, with RARE being a settler-led organization, an organization that's also very white, 
um, I feel we have a, a lot of work to do to work towards those those positive changes that that can be possible and that you're talking about. So thank you for sharing your your personal insights on that with you. Um, as Tamisha said, we have time for questions. So if there are questions from the audience, um, please plug them into the Q and A window, and then we can can share those. Yeah, I, I really love the example you gave in the beginning where you spoke about the, you know, re re respecting the relationships with our elders, right, and the relationship with your grandma in particular and how she how careful she was in, in taking care of the land because she really understood that the, the land is what sustains us. We depend on it for our food and our well-being and such things. I, I think that's that's really important. And I think there's a real opportunity in there as well to um, to have sort of cross general cross generational aspects to that that work as well because another thing that I'm seeing in the environmental sector across a lot of different organizations is it feels like we're we're kind of missing on engaging the youth a lot or or, or offering opportunities for engaging the elders and the youth together and have that exchange. Of, of different perspectives and, and different attitudes and that, that mutual learning, which I think. Um, I, I think a lot of it is that we, we're so used as used to as, as a society, like separating ourselves, right? We're so used to looking at things in one perspective when there are so many ways that we can look at, like, again, like you said, cross-generational. If we're, I'll, I'll take a, you know, a stab at a cleanup day for, as, as an example. We usually see either a youth that organization saying, hey, we're having a cleanup day or an organization that speaks to, um, you know, our elders or people in a different generation specifically in that move in that in that um, in that uh, sorry, in that 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 activity. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think it takes us stepping into a collaborative, a collaborative view to say, hey, maybe we don't have all the resources on this side. We don't they don't have all the knowledge resources on this side. How do we come together to build something that like build a foundation that is so strong that we're now sharing information and we're sharing knowledge and we're carrying that forward? Because I guarantee you there's so much we can learn from the younger generation as so much they can learn from us. So finding spaces where we can work collaboratively, share information and share knowledge is important. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely, absolutely right. I think the, the other point you were talking about, you know, about reimagining relationships um, also really resonated with me because what I've started to think more about recently is, is kind of what, what rang through in your presentation as well as that, and I can also only speak from my perspective as, as a white woman who is also an, an immigrant. And uh, I, I'm, what I'm just seeing is that we often in these leadership roles in conservation organizations, people who have a similar background to me, we make a lot of assumptions and often these assumptions are really wrong. <laughs> and by the time we realize that the harm has already happened. So that's really been a big learning experience for us, I think, in this organization to really be, be sort of hyper self-reflective on, on, you know, not just just pushing out this sort of celebratory content and patting ourselves on the shoulders, but also really look more critically, okay, like where have we screwed up? And, and, and how, how can, we, can we do that better going forward and create these relationships that are deeper and that are not superficial and that are not, and, and that really enables us to move at that, that pace of trust and grow that trust in the long term versus wanting to, to try and demonstrate that kind of the, the quick successes that fit into the one year grant proposal period or whatever is driving these things sometimes. I think that's a part of the problem too. And I've often spoken, you know, to other, other companies about that grant, that grant process and how that leads to urgency versus sustainability or yeah. versus building long-term relationships. Cause we're so focused on, especially when it comes to work around working with, um, with diverse communities, a lot of healing has to happen before the real work begins, right? A lot of healing of relationships, a lot of personal healing of individuals in these spaces to make the work meaningful. Sometimes it's, you know, it's, we might think it's so complicated, but that's because we're thinking in terms of what does this grant allow us to do? So we're going to skip all the, all the building step. We're going to skip everything that requires us to work 
on a long-term basis with the community to understand who they are and understand how they're showing up. We're, we're so focused on doing this in the time that this grant allows, and we often miss the opportunity or miss a moment to think beyond what the grant you know, the grant timing is or what the funding timing is and to think how we, how an organization itself can do the work outside of that grant and not be so focused on just maintaining that relationship that happened because that grant was offered. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, here, Christine is asking a question which, which actually kind of relates to that because she would like to know if there's, if there's any conservation organization um, that you could point to, particularly in, in these predominantly white spaces that is actually doing a, a better job at helping black indigenous and, and global people of color to get involved and to, or to create those welcoming spaces that that can lead to further engagement and better relationship building is there anything in particular that that resonated particularly with you i think the one i will speak to is the relationship that brown girl outdoor world has managed to um to build with Ontario, with uh, Nature Canada through on their relationship with Ontario Nature through their relationship with um, Nature Canada, and um, one of the programs that we were involved with creating was the um, that program that they had uh, sometime I think it was later last year that had a, a grant process a grant program specific to communities or organizations that were working with communities of color to help with um, with um, with being able to, I think it was being able to pay like a living wage to the to employees. So if you're employing a youth, there was this grant, youth from a community of color, from a black indigenous um, community of color to get those youth involved in working in, in, um, in that space. They were providing funding. And, you know, as much as I often say money isn't all, there's so much that it, it, it can do to get folks into this space, you know, educational opportunities, getting people involved where they don't think that the only thing they can do to survive is work outside of this, but that there's a space in here where they can come in, get paid and still manage to pay their bills at the end of the day, right? So that was super important in, in um, as a part of the relationship that we, we had uh, created. I think we started not last year, but the year before and the work in that still continues today. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. That is is really important. Um, creating kind of better work opportunities in in the sector, better opportunities for people to be paid appropriately and and uh, to to engage, I think is is really important because not not everyone can volunteer their time, and we should be really making much more of an effort to ensure that um, we we do people pay at least a living wage, ideally more, because. If, if you drill down into the into the specific specifics of that, I think we can do even even better still. But it's a start, right? It's a start, and it's a start, and that's where conversation is needed to continue to keep that going, right? We don't just come in. That's I speak about the importance of creating long term relationships. If we're just saying here we're going to do this now, and as soon as this grant is done, then we forgot about those people who we brought in. Like, what purpose yeah. did, did that serve? You know. Yes, you might have given them the information in the six month period that you had to use all the funds, but now what? You've given me this information. I've barely gotten any um, connections outside of this organization. Where do I go now? Where do I go with all this information that you've given me? And how do I execute the knowledge that I've gained in my community to get more folks interested? Yeah, absolutely. And that, that can't be in the interest of the funders either, because as you say, it's not sustainable. It doesn't create long lasting sustainable impact if, if that's what we're doing. So I do think that needs to change. And I think there are, uh, are funders now who are more and more kind of listening to that too and and make make themselves available more long term and, and for these things. So I, I do think I'm seeing a shift a little bit in, in that direction from some funders at least. So that's that's great. Um, Nina is asking you also something that relates a little bit to this. Um, what can one do at the individual level or the personal level to positively influence the growth of diversity and conservation? When uh, earlier when I said, um, you know, we have to personalize this, right? We think about people who sit in positions of power within organizations. And we don't think of when we say power, I don't mean you have to be the CEO or the, of the organization or the director. It's where do you have, you know, um, you don't have to be sitting in a C-suite position to make change. Where do you sit on the engagements and relationships you have with communities of color outside of, of, um, of your everyday work? 
where do you sit as an individual individual and what biases you bring into conversations when you start speaking to folks of communities of um, from communities of color about their place in conservation are we trying to unlearn so much of what we have been taught from a um from a colonial perspective in how we think people are engaged with um with the environmental with the conservation movement right are we coming into conversations and asking and listening instead of telling. A lot of times we, 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 we often, and I find that even with myself as someone who's learning, again, because I don't speak for every community, I put myself in a position, if I'm going in to ask a question, I can't be giving you the response. I need for you to tell me what you need me to do and how you need me to engage here and how you, how you see this relationship working out. Because if I'm the one defining the relationship and telling you exactly what I need you to do, there are parameters that you're setting that I might not be able to fulfill because I don't have support. What you see as me being able, as me being able to do something from a, from a, a, an individual perspective might not be something that I have the bandwidth for, right? So coming in, listening, you know, asking the questions, listening for the responses, and then seeing how you can execute whatever, um, whatever, whatever way you can contribute to making those things happen. Um, Again, having conversations in your communities, like the communities that you exist in, how do you see conservation work happening outside of that group? You know, is there is there ways that these communities can partner with other organizations? And when I say communities, I mean, you know, your mom, your dad, your aunt, your uncle. These are people who form a part of your community and they're still very personal to you. So how are you having these conversations at home? How are you educating to say, hey, you know what? I realized that the conservation movement is this way and there's no community outside of this that's benefiting from, the, from, from this movement. How do we change that? How do we do our part individually to make sure that you know, we're touching on so many different things in so many different communities that can get them involved from a personal perspective? And that's making, again, when I say know it, love it, protect it, it's giving the individual the information that they, they need to know what the conservation movement is and how that affects um, our ecosystems or how that affects the land. They come to love it. Now everybody wants to say, hey, maybe when I go fishing and I'm, I'm doing catch and release, I'm no longer just thinking about the fish that's in my hand. I'm now thinking about everything that has come down the riverbed and how I've affected anything from how the things I've put in my kitchen sink how that filters back into our water and how that has now gotten into that fish's life. And what can I do from my, my own point to make sure I'm not continuing that cycle of anything that could be harmful to the environment? Yeah, yeah. In, in fact, I find the link of, to, of, of fishing to conservation quite interesting too. How did you personally get involved in fishing? I didn't wanna to go to church on a Sunday and I picked up a, a rod, a piece of crochet thread and a safety needle and went to the, a safety pin, sorry, and went to the Humber River and tried to fish, caught nothing, but it inspired me to go and do more research and figure out what I needed to get done to become a better angler or to become an angler, period. Yeah, that's great. Um, we have a couple more questions here. Uh, James is asking, uh, could, you, could you summarize some steps? And, and maybe you've spoken to that already a little bit, but maybe you have some, some other insights as well. He's particularly interested in people who have privileged positions, so perhaps the, the ones who are in the leadership role at, uh, roles at the moment or the, the people who are on the boards within the conservation movement. What, what can they do um, in order to encourage inclusion within the movement? One of the things, and again, I'll go back to speaking up where you have that position, or that privilege, right? Yeah. If you know, you're in a room and you look around you and you're having a meeting, and you notice that everyone at this meeting looks exactly like you or people who are, you know, there's no diversity there. How are you challenging that within the organizational structure? Mm -hmm. You have the power, you have the access to, to, to that C-suite, you know, executive to say, hey, you know what? I've noticed that every time we've had a meeting, we've been talking about including, um, uh, including communities of color, including um, Black and Indigenous peoples into this conversation but I still haven't seen any changes. I haven't seen anyone there. What can we do? What steps are we taking to make sure that our words are more than just words and they're actually actionable steps that I can say, hey, someone down in HR could make this, this move out in, in, in outside to say, hey, maybe we're going to need to bring more people in and we're going to bring people in to say, 
this is how we are actively making change and no longer just, we're not just talking about it anymore, but we're stepping into a space of, of creating actual change. Yes, and, and that's a good point. And that sort of segues into, into the remaining couple of questions there too, which, which is kind of like, what are the concrete sort of actions we can do? And, and one of them obvious is, is, is going out there and reaching out and just seeking, trying to make those connections. Perhaps not going in with with great expectation of, of of something to happen right away, but making that first step. And and I think I feel like there's still often a barrier to doing that in in many of of these organizations because as as you said, to to build this trust, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort, and uh, yeah, and and I feel there's there's still sometimes some hesitation and some apprehension um, to to get into into that. So I think that's something. We really need to get get better at from from my perspective in these organizations to make those steps and to invest in that in the long term and to be and to be okay with being uncomfortable in creating yeah. that change right like we can't i don't think there's there should be a full-on expectation to just be this is how i'm going to go in i have this structure i see it working out exactly this way and if it doesn't work out of this this way then i'm backing out there has to be room for growth. There has to be room for learning, listening, and acting on that. Maybe, maybe the, the solution that you walked into that conversation is, is not what's going to be a fit for that community. So have dialogue with that community and see how that's going to work. See what solutions they might already have, right, that you haven't considered, and see how that could work into either building the relationship or even giving more clarity to what the, 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 the expectations you had can look like. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's so true. And that speaks a bit too to what you said earlier about the, you know, who, who benefits? It cannot just be for the organization or for the appearance the organization is, is, is making or wanting to have or anything along those lines. It needs to meet those, those community needs. So from, from your perspective and the community that you're most involved with in, in the work you do in Toronto, what, what are the, the biggest kind of short-term and, and long-term needs that you see there right now? Again, speaking from the community that I'm engaged with and for no one else, because I can't do that, a lot of it, it becomes, we're not having the conversation. We've stopped, we've seen where it's stopped since, you know, June, 2020, when it was all the rage, when diversity was all the rage, you know, getting people involved was all the rage. That conversation has become so quiet now. It's become to the point where it's almost non-existent and communities aren't holding corporations or organizations accountable anymore and organizations see that hey maybe we're not being held accountable we don't need to do this so a lot of the ball has dropped a lot of people have dropped the ball in that whole chain of uh, of change and now we're back at some places are back at square one there are no conversations happening um even if folks are going in and getting involved some some are saying hey we're going to throw money at the situation and just leave it be when you throw money at the situation and just leave it that's not a resource it's it's just saying here there's money go spend it how you how you see it what about you know giving more knowledge what about saying hey we as an organization have already established this this great great community can we work together to make sure these are going in so again a lot of it goes back to the conversations that are not being had the access that's not being provided to that room or you know folks not seeing themselves again as as being a part of that conversation because now it's died and there are people who weren't paying attention in 2020 who are not, who are now seeing things in 2021 and 2022 and being like how can i get involved but there's no real foundation set for those conversations to continue or those spaces to continue to be created yeah and Jenna is also having an interesting question here. Um, she says, we know that some people do not feel comfortable or safe on public trails. Do you have any recommendations for how an organization or landowner who maintains public trails can make improvements, for example, through signage infrastructure or to help create making safer spaces? So I think a lot of that has to do again with, you know, we're looking at this from a, a, um, a solution-based perspective versus going back to the question of why don't folks feel safe? Like we have to solve the, the issue of why they don't feel safe before we start implementing strategies to make them feel safe. The reasons I could not feel safe because I'm a woman. The intersectional reason I could not feel safe is because I'm a black woman. The reason I could feel not feel safe is because I've had such a bad experience with the outdoors that had nothing to do with my life here in Canada. 
But now I have to come here and reestablish a relationship to a place that's so unfamiliar to me with no resources. So, you know, asking why I think first to figure out why folks don't feel safe is more important than creating the solution to make sure, you know, they feel safe because then it could be something that doesn't speak to what is going to make me feel safe. Cause I could say, Hey, maybe there's signage here, but do I know what a blaze means? Do I know what, mm -hmm. you know, when I see like something that says it's a protected area, protected from what? Like, why am I not allowed in it? Then that becomes a challenge to me to figure out why I don't belong in it. Mm -hmm. So I think understanding first why folks don't feel safe is important to, to figuring out how we can go ahead and, and make changes to ensure that people feel safe. And also understanding that safety for everyone, not safety for everyone might not be safety for, every, for anyone. Because again, what we see as safe, and I might say to you, this is completely feel safe to me. Like my example of some places that I go fishing, I'm out there by myself sometimes and people will be like, why the heck are you out there by yourself? And I'm like, this feels completely safe to me. Mm -hmm. Someone who is from a woman who is from the LGBTQ plus community and who has a different, um, a different racial identity from me might not feel safe out there. But because I've gone out there, I've had the experiences. To me, this is nothing. But I can't say that this space has now created safety for everyone. Yeah, yeah, that does make a lot of sense. And kind of what, what I'm what I'm hearing throughout all of this is we really have to seek a lot more conversations in conservation yep. than I think we've previously been doing, and we have to keep going back to that and and just continue to to learn more and ask those those hard questions of ourselves, but also the questions of of other people, what 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 are their needs? Like why why are they not here, and and how can we do better at uh, at creating those spaces? Yep. Yeah. So thank you so much for for sharing your personal insights with us tonight. Uh, I I really enjoyed what you were speaking about, and there was a lot of of food for thought there. I I think. Um, uh, I thank everyone for joining as well. Um, but before you all leave and head out. I would very kindly ask you all to please support Demisha's work and leadership directly, if you can, because she is currently running a GoFundMe campaign to raise money to be able to purchase a vehicle to bring more people into the outdoors, which is really great, of course. So please visit her webpage and consider supporting her important work by making a donation towards that effort. And the, as you know, the more people step up, the faster she can reach her goals. So please consider making a gift tonight. And James, I think we'll be posting the link in the chat box. Or if you Google um, Brown Girl Outdoor World and visit uh, Demisha's website, you can go to the Help Us Grow section to find the link for the campaign as well. And I know from experience how difficult it can be to raise funds for a vehicle in particular. So every dollar really, I think, goes a long way in this effort and you can make a, a big difference uh, to supporting this. So uh, lastly, I also want to thank James and, and Chris for organizing the event tonight and dealing with all the tech. And uh, we hope we see you again at our next Conversation for Conservation, which is scheduled to take place Wednesday, April 27th at 7 p.m. And thank you again, Demisha, for being here tonight. And uh, I wish everyone a good night. Thank you. Thank you.